It could be said that the invention of the nuclear weapon is probably one of man's greatest achievements, but at the same time, it is also one of the most terrifying inventions ever created. Some say the threat of nuclear war is still very real, while others say that it will never happen. But just how much destructive capability would all the world's nuclear weapons have if they exploded at the same time? Robert J. Oppenheimer was the father of the atomic bomb. He was officially credited by the War Department with achieving the implementation of atomic energy for military purposes. But after he saw its devastating power, which was like nothing anyone had expected, he and others had started to question the work that they accomplished. After the successful detonation of the bomb, he made a statement in which he remembered some text from some ancient Hindu scripture, and he was quoted as saying, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. It was the beginning of a frightening new era, and since its invention, there has been an ongoing race to see who could build the most powerful nuclear weapon. On March 1, 1954, on Bikini Atoll in the Pacific, the United States conducted a hydrogen bomb test that had seemingly gone out of control. This is because the bomb designers used 30% lithium-6 and 70% lithium-7 as fuel. But what scientists didn't know is that lithium-7 would be stripped of one of its neutrons early in the reaction and become lithium-6, at which point would become bond fuel. The weapon was designed to have a yield of 5 megatons. But because of the unknown reaction of lithium-7, it ended up having a 14.8 megaton yield. The crater left by the Castle Bravo test is so large that it is visible from space and was about 1,000 times as powerful as that of Hiroshima. But Russia was getting ready to show the world something of their own. The RDS-220 hydrogen bomb, also known as the Tsar Bomba, was the biggest and most powerful thermonuclear bomb ever made. It was exploded by the Soviet Union on October 30, 1961, over Novaya Zemlya Island in the Russian Arctic Sea. It was estimated to be a 57 megaton weapon. The bomb was so big that it was said to be more constructing a small house than building a bomb. It was 26 feet long and was 7 feet in diameter and it weighed 60,000 pounds. At the time, it wasn't possible to put this powerful of a warhead on a rocket. It was simply a true display of raw power. The Tsar Bomba was almost 4,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. Had the bomb been made with a depleted uranium tamper instead of a lead one, the yield would have been 100 megatons. Novaya Zemlya Island was also used for other nuclear weapons tests by the Soviet Union at the time. One of those was an underground test which involved four nuclear devices, totaling 4.2 megatons, total yield. During this test, pressures underground from the explosion created a seismic magnitude of 6.97 on the Richter scale. This set off an 80 million ton avalanche that blocked two glacial streams and created a one and a half mile lake. Despite the dangers of natural disasters, there have been 224 nuclear detonations on the island with a total explosive energy equivalent to 265 megatons. Despite it being the most powerful nuclear explosion, the weapon was unconventional and the plane that dropped it had to be specifically outfitted to carry the enormous and incredibly heavy bomb over the target area. During the same time, the United States was testing another weapon. The B-41, also known as the MK-41, was a three-stage nuclear weapon, which was a tertiary stage bomb, meaning it had an additional fusion stage compressed by a previous fusion stage. This meant that a bomb could be made with yields as large as desired. The B-41 was 12 feet 4 inches long and was 4 feet 4 inches in diameter with a 25 megaton yield and weighed 10,690 pounds. By 1963, the United States claimed it could produce a 35 megaton warhead and put it on a Titan II, which could carry an 8,200 pound payload, which would almost double the yield to weight ratio of the B-41. It remains the highest yield to weight ratio of any weapon ever created. About 500 of these weapons were made between September 1960 to June 1962, but they have all since been retired. Despite the terrifying power of these weapons, conventional warheads that missiles are able to carry only have a yield of 1.2 to 1.5 megatons. However, one should not make the mistake thinking that this is not a powerful weapon. Some super heavy intercontinental missiles can carry any number of warheads, from a single independent warhead up to 10 warheads. 
According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, only nine countries have nuclear weapons. The United States has 6,450 total warheads, and Russia has 6,850, which collectively account for 92% of the world's stockpile. China has the next largest amount with 280 warheads, a tiny fraction compared to the US and Russia, and none of them are deployed. Other countries make up the rest of the 885 nuclear warheads, which are also not deployed, but locked up in some military facilities. In 1985, there were 70,000 nuclear warheads on the planet, either stockpiled or retired. Today, there are 14,465 nuclear warheads, and of these, approximately 9,335 are in the military stockpiles. The rest are awaiting dismantlement. 3,750 warheads are deployed with operational forces, of which about 1,800 U.S., Russian, British, and French warheads are on high alert, ready for use on short notice. The current largest nuclear weapon in the U.S. stockpile is a 1.2 megaton yield nuclear weapon, the B-83, and Russia has the super-heavy thermonuclear armed RS-28 Sarmat, or as NATO designates them, the Satan II which can be fitted with 10 750 kiloton warheads. Most warheads could either be combined on a single ICBM or fitted independently on smaller rockets. But there are other massive weapons being deployed. Based on leaked Russian documents, Canyon is a nuclear-armed autonomous torpedo capable of traveling 6,213 miles with a 100 megaton thermonuclear weapon as its payload. That's at least twice as powerful as any nuclear weapon ever tested. It's not known how many 100 megaton thermonuclear weapons exist at this point, but it is almost certain that it is being built or developed now, and Russia could already have one or two. If all the nuclear bombs, including the ones locked up in bunkers, and all the warheads that are deployed in missile silos exploded, they would cause incredible damage and loss of lives, despite the fact that some warheads would be in missile silos and in storage bunkers. Some of these warheads would be in nuclear bunkers deep in the ground, and the explosions would trigger massive earthquakes. It wouldn't be much different than an all-out nuclear war, except the missiles would be in the ground. Nuclear weapons are configured to detonate in one of two ways, either by ground impact or air burst, where the weapon explodes when it reaches a certain altitude. Airburst nuclear explosions can create much more damage and increase the explosion pressure and damage. That is why most nuclear weapons are configured to airburst detonate. But less pressure doesn't mean less devastation. Now imagine all the nuclear weapons we have exploding at once. The initial explosions would light up and burn the areas for hours, building up enormous fires. Most heavy missiles with multiple independent warheads would vaporize inside of the silo with the majority of the blast exiting the blast doors at the top, creating man-made radioactive volcanoes and leaving molten craters and showering the area with radioactive particles. Even a small nuclear exchange would create firestorms and wreck the planet's atmosphere. Simulations show that it would only take 115 kiloton bombs to destroy more than a quarter of the Earth's ozone layer in just two years. Protective gases in the atmosphere would drop, letting through harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. The climate change would be unprecedented, and the world would shut down. Now imagine what 14,000 nukes would do. It would be a game over, even if a single missile never left a silo. In the water, nuclear weapons carried by submarines could create massive tsunamis, depending on how close to the surface or how close to the seafloor they were. It's possible that massive earthquakes and tsunamis could be triggered by such a powerful explosion. If it was only one nuclear warhead, it might not be as catastrophic. The U.S. Navy has 18 Ohio-class submarines, which are capable of carrying 24 missiles, which can be configured with a maximum of eight nuclear warheads. If you do the math, you understand how powerful a blast could be underwater. Imagine 18 submarines exploding underwater in different parts of the world at a force of nearly 230 megatons each. And this is just the U.S. Navy. But what if we took all the nuclear warheads in the world and put them in one place and detonated them? Not all warheads have the same yield, so it might be impossible to say exactly how much explosive power we would end up with. 
But if you consider that the average nuke is between 750 kilotons to 1.2 megatons, you would still have a large blast somewhere in the 15,000 megaton range or more. It's hard to even imagine such an explosion, which would be massive and the light from it would travel through space. The crater left from the explosion would be massive. The amount of radioactivity that it would spread would end life as we know it in just days, depending on where the explosion was. The explosion might cause a massive tectonic plate movement, and there would be massive earthquakes and volcanoes as a chain reaction across the planet began after the explosion. All of that sounds really scary. Of course, there really isn't any way of knowing exactly what will happen, but it's likely that the Earth will survive as it goes through a nuclear winter and all life is extinguished from the massive radioactivity. Luckily, there is no way that all the nuclear weapons could be pulled to one location and then detonated unless you are Apocalypse from X-Men. So there is no need to worry. The threat of nuclear war is always ever-present, and the doomsday clock sits at two minutes to midnight. Let's hope that it never strikes midnight. We hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. We appreciate you and want to thank you for watching.